a lot of people think trading is very easy. You know, 27 years later, I'm still, I'm still learning. I became overconfident with my views. Actually, the fundamental view was right, but I put on too big a position too early and lost a lot of money, um, which basically means I was wrong. And as soon as I see someone say, I think or I reckon, I switch off because, well, what happens in 12 to 18 months is of absolutely no relevance to me whatsoever. So you, you code up your set of rules that you think work and then you back test it on data. Um, and you need to back test it on several sets of data. So now we have big data. One fund I know, they ping hotel groups up to a million times a day to get prices for hotel rooms. They know the hotel algorithms, so they know in real time what the current and future occupancy rates are of all the major hotels around the world. One thing that is interesting is the trader at this bank. He was very successful, and yet he was willing, he was looking to undergo training, looking to improve. Welcome to the Alpha Mind podcast, a podcast which explores how people can optimize personal performance when engaging in trading and investment activities and beyond. We focus in particular on the mental, psychological, behavioral, and emotional aspects of taking a managing risk and the intangible performance aspects of trading and investment. Welcome to today's Alpha Mind podcast with myself, Stephen Goldstein, and my co-host, Mark Randall. Today, we're going to be speaking to James Brody. James is not quite a former colleague, but we worked at the same investment bank for a while in the late, mid to late 1990s. We were both traders at the time, although James worked in an overseas office and I was based in London. So we never quite worked together, but you know, James is someone who I'm very excited to have on the podcast. Very knowledgeable guy, very intelligent, knows so much about markets, so much about trading. Really, I think, I think you're going to get so much out of listening to this today. So I'm going to go straight into this. Um, before we do, a quick word from our sponsors today. Today's episode of the Alpha Mind podcast is brought to you by Alpha R Cubed and the Mark Randall Consultancy. Alpha R Cubed deliver bespoke coaching and development programs for people, teams, and businesses engaged in risk, trading, and investment activities. The Mark Randall Consultancy delivers powerful mind fitness programs to businesses in the corporate, investment, and financial market world. Now, on with the podcast. Uh, welcome to this week's Alpha Mind podcast with myself, Stephen Goldstein, my co host, Mark Randall. And, and our guest, James. Welcome, James. Okay. Hi, Steve. Hi, Mark. Thanks very much for having me on. In my background, yeah, quick 27 years in the financial markets. Um, I started at what was the biggest bank in the world, Daiichi Kangyo Bank. Um, quite a funny story. I'd been there just 30 minutes into my career in the city of London. And I'd been introduced to my new manager, Keith Broughton. And then the head of the dealing room came over to me. He bowed. And he said, James, son, here are your derivatives trading with this. And I turned to Keith and I said, what's the derivative? Um, that's, how the, that's how the London trading was in those days. And he laughed and he passed me a book, John J. Murphy's Introduction to Technical Analysis, um, which I read pretty quickly. And fast forward a year and a half, we had an aggressive bond market sell-off. I was one of the few traders in the rooms in profit and making money trend following. And... I was using technical analysis. It was just discipline for me at the time. Um, then I had the chance to move to big Swiss investment bank. I was in London till 2000, then a year and a half in New York, then a year and a half in Tokyo, and then 14 years in Singapore. Dirt trading mainly, short-term interest rate trading with proprietary limits as well. Um, what was interesting, actually, as my career progressed through there, I... I became less disciplined. Um, I became more confident in my own views. I had big trading limits. Um, I had flow coming into my books because I was market making as well. So you had the cushion of profit being put into your books when you're not actually doing anything. So that's not actually really trading, but you had money coming in. So my discipline kind of faltered. Um, I became overconfident with my views. And interestingly, actually, two really painful losses in my career, both of them, Actually, the fundamental view was right, but I put on too big a position too, big a position too early and lost a lot of money, um, which basically means I was wrong. Then I joined a Canadian investment bank, actually, as the financial crisis was um, unfolding. I was there um, from 2010 and then set up a 
hedge fund with a couple of former colleagues from Japan. We had five algorithms trading 24 hours. And um, it was at this point that actually I learned to code VBA to start with, and the last couple of years I've been doing Python. It's very interesting when you start coding and you write up your trading theories and then you back test them and you have to be uh, very careful back testing to make sure your trades will be entered, you're not curve fitting or data mining. And to see the things that I thought worked that didn't work, the things I didn't think worked that worked. Um, the importance of volatility was something I never really looked at that much. Um, the fund started well, but then as we went into 2014, volatility went to all time lows in all the asset classes. Um, and that continued till M uh, April, May 2014, when Mario Draghi said he'd do whatever it takes. And of course, the euro collapsed, um, oil collapsed, and volatility came back. Um, we sold that to a family office in 2015. And since then, basically, I've been trading for myself. I do um, about 40 presentations a year on technical analysis. I started looking at behavioral finance about five years ago. Um, and that's one big regret I have. You know, the, the things I wish I'd known from day one was my own personality, my own emotions. Um, and that was fascinating. A, a great book, um, Behavioral Investing by James Montier. Um, I, say, I read that about five years ago and I laughed and I cried the whole way through it because I could see every behavioral bias in there, I could see myself. And, and so what I do now, as I say, I, I trade for myself, I do um, presentations on these sort of topics, and I also uh, more recently started work with a big um, systematic hedge fund writing algorithms for them. So it's been a fun journey, um, and it's incredible how it's 27 years, but it's just continual learning. And you're not just learning about yourself and your trading and, and and for instance, technical analysis to me, technical analysis, I'm on the board of the Chartered Market Technicians Association, but I'm not a huge advocate that technical analysis is a crystal ball that will, will make you money, not at all. Technical analysis to me is just discipline. First of all, it tells you if there's a trend, if the price action's breaking out, and if I'm gonna put on a trade, then where's my stop loss? Where do I get out of the trade? And um, so yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's a fascinating journey. And the other thing, of course, is it's not just me that's changed in my trading, but it's how the markets have changed. So in the 90s, we didn't really, I started looking at charts very early on, but we didn't look more at the data. You were, we weren't programming algorithms. Um, in the 2000s, it, we, had, we had the financial crisis, we had the, um, the NASDAQ bubble. We had trends, we had, Interest rates, you know, I was trading just before the financial crisis, Kiwi two-year yields are up at 8%. Um, but now, of course, interest rates have compressed currencies, there's less volatility. And the last couple of years, of course, we see so much algorithms in markets that without a doubt make fundamental trading very hard because algorithms, the trend, low latency algorithms exaggerate trends. And of course, we have uh, Donald Trump tweeting, which is a completely new dynamic. So I've done some work with a commodity, uh, big commodity trading company, and it's with the traders there. They've identified that the moment Donald Trump started tweeting, the traders have become less profitable because you get this intraday volatility around his tweet that's just stopping out, um, stopping out trades that have stop losses too close. Okay, that, that's brilliant. I mean, what a great, great summary. I think we can almost stop the podcast there. Um, there, there's so much in there, and I, may, maybe I can perhaps ask you a question, which, which I recently put out as a tweet. It was a question I asked to Greg Gossett last week and to some of my our previous guests. You know, what three things that you wish you'd have known when you started that you know now? What are the three key things? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. It's something I suddenly thought when you were going doing a quick summary of the introduction. One is the importance of behavioral finance. So one thing I've done, I've done twice, I've done the full NEOAC personality um, psychometric test. I've done it with um, two clinical psychologists, one at John Hopkins University in the United States and one with a professor from Sebi University in the Philippines. And what was interesting is it highlighted my own biases 
Um, certain traits I have uh, that are bad for trading. One is I'm overconfident, um, I'm overly aggressive, I'm also I'm overly positive, which is a great life trait to have, um, but it's actually bad for trading because you tend to, those three traits alone mean you know, I'm overconfident in my views, so fundamental views I, um, I'm willing to put on, and again, sometimes ignore technicals. That was you know, when I was uh, working for banks. Um, I'd have too big a position size. And of course, you, if you're overly positive, you're looking at the rewards, but you're ignoring the risks. Um, what I did well um, in these tests was the um, conscientiousness. So C1 and C2, particularly order, which means I'm much better as a, a program trader. So trading off sets of rules. But the interesting thing is, even though I know what my personality is like and I know the weaknesses and the biases that I suffer from, I still see myself suffering from them. So even though we have these biases, people, um, there's a great bias called um, blind spot bias, where we see these biases in other people, but we think we're better than that and we don't see these biases within ourselves. So again, that's a good reason why sometimes, you know, I have a view and I suddenly think, hold on a minute, this is the same, you know, we read through before. And that's why so program trading works so well for me now. Um, so that would be one, understanding my own behaviors and, um, and psychology. Another one would be, and I've been thinking this, one thing, I use, I use Twitter, I don't use it so much now, but you can follow some great, some of the great traders who've made money for decades on there. You can follow some great technical analysts who highlight you know, what things that have moved overnight. But there's just so much rubbish on there of people with opinions. And as soon as I see someone say, I think or I reckon, I switch off. Because every day you could read people have these quite compelling reasons why gold should go up and others why gold should go down. Why dollars should go up and the dollar should go down. And in the same vein, you have economists and we used to get bombarded with economic analysis. And, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not knocking economists and analysts any, any way because it's an impossible job. We don't know what Donald Trump's going to tweet in the next 10 minutes, let alone where the S&P is going to be at year end. But I used to read this sort of thing. In the last, yeah, last 24 hours, I've seen on Twitter, yeah, people talking about when the US recession is going to start. And people talking about green shoots of recovery and we should be a full-blown recovery in 12 to 18 months. Well, what happens in 12 to 18 months is of absolutely no relevance to me whatsoever because I'm trying to make money today. Um, so that would be one, ignoring people's views, ignoring external analysis and economists because it's just longer term. I want to look at what's moving the market right now. And again, discipline. I only want to go with a trend. Um, and that's one thing a bit of what I do vouch for with technical analysis is um, if you're familiar with the mark analysis, the TD setup, so the green nines in effect to, to simplify it. Well, actually looking at that, I used to do a lot of work around looking at uh, the mark. What it highlights really well, the mark, is on the weekly charts, how often you get three month trends. So, of course, you get four bar um, set up to get the first first number, and then you get nine bars after that. So 13 bars, 13 weeks is three months. And so often you see these three-month trends. So one thing I'd look at is um, within an algorithm, I have this with typically four or five other pointers. But just I like using the 8 and 21-day moving average. Because if, if they're both going up, then it might be the start of a trend high that could last for three months. If they're both going down, it could be start to a trend lower that could last for three months. Of course, it could last for three minutes if Donald Trump tweets. Um, but if I've got a stop loss, then I'm out. So I'm not concerned about a trend that's going to last for one year or two years because long term trends, if they do go on that long, they have pretty, pretty aggressive pullbacks in between. So I'm only ever going with the short term trends. If they're both going up, I only ever buy when both moving averages are going up. I would only ever sell when both are going down with a stop loss. And that prevents me, if I have a fundamental view, having a view that's just plain wrong. Let's take um, something on gold, for instance. If I have a view that gold's going up, 
but actually it's trending down, then I'm not going to be buying it. I won't buy it until the moment that the trend actually starts to turn higher. And just a simple rule like that, it's technical analysis, but it's an overcoming, it's technical analysis is discipline to just overcome my own biases. Um, waffling a little bit. Um, the third one I would come up with actually is, you know, I started using TA from day one, but it's looking at understanding the weaknesses in technical analysis. Um, an example, you know, the golden cross and the death cross, you'll hear them on, on the TV channels, you'll hear them mentioned regularly, they don't work. You can back test them, they don't work. Um, they're so backward looking. Again, if you're looking at trends that last for three months and then a golden cross, which is the 50 day moving above the 100, uh, 200 day moving average, by the time that happens, you've had the three month trend already. Other things, you know, people talk about head and shoulders patterns with great conviction, but it's something like back testing shown only about 56% of the time is it actually a reversal pattern. Nearly half the time, it's actually just a consolidation before a continuation pattern. And the other great one, the 200 day moving average, people have used it for, to great effect in stock trading because stocks at the end of the day go from bottom left of the chart to top right over time. But equities, so that's for equities, but for you know, commodities and FX and bonds, they're much more um, range bound over time. So 200 day moving average again, doesn't work in those markets whatsoever. Whereas it might, has been used to great effect in stocks. Probably the simplest rule you could possibly have. If the stock market goes up from bottom left to top right over time, then a rule as simple as that would work. But again, it comes down to discipline. Right, okay. That's, that's brilliant. I mean, it's a great summary. Uh, Mark, any thoughts on that at all? I'm very interested in your transition from, I guess, traditional trading to algo trading, and, you know, code writing, and as to whether you found that that an easy journey. And you know, I know that you use sort of you know behavioural finance sort of uh, you know to training to sort of understand your biases and to not apply that in general. And of course, the discipline of program trading would would sort of iron some of those out, but. Do you find that um, you have to be quite careful as to how you, you put, you know, coding together to create the algo outcomes that you require? Is, is, has that been um, something that uh, was easy for you to do? And uh, have you become more effective by, by using an algo-based strategy? Yeah, it's a good point. It's, it's a big move going to the, the algo side because firstly, it's something I wanted to do because I wanted to, I'd always use technicals for trading, but I wanted to, to code it up and test it. But I'm showing how, sort of showing my age and how lazy I am. I got through school and university without turning a computer on. So obviously I was pretty efficient in Excel. So when we set up the fund, we did it in VBA because that's Excel based. So it's very visual easy relatively easy to learn and also we weren't high frequency so we didn't need speed of execution um, and i learned that pretty much I, the basics i got to grips with it in a month that was february 2011. Um, and then when you can code of course you're right there's huge huge holes that you can fall into um, curve fittings one so if you take data this is where machine learning has certain issues you take data and try and find a pattern in it of course, you're finding a pattern in that data, but you're not, that's, you're not going to necessarily find it in the next set of data. So you, you code up your set of rules that you think work, and then you back test it on data. Um, and you need to back test it on several sets of data. So we, we ended up trading just G10FX because it's a 24 hour liquid market, but we back tested it across many markets, um, really from the time period of about 2002, 2010. And you've got to make sure you can execute as well. Quite often people, um, we had some youngsters show us some code. It looked like they had this algorithm that was fantastic. And when we looked at it in more detail, they were making the assumption, for instance, it might be payroll day. And looking back, their algorithm saw that dollar yen was trading at, say, 110. It had been in that range for, for a couple of weeks, you know, 110 to 110.20. Payroll, really strong number came out and it suddenly jumped to 
and back testing their algorithm looked at the data and assumed that as soon as it broke out to 110.25, then it executed the trade. But of course, you know, reality is there's no liquidity in the market and it probably moved 40 or 50 points before you could have executed any, um, you could have actually executed your position in the real world. So of course we had to make sure that every time we identified a trade, and we put the order in, the market actually came back and would have filled our order. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. We looked at three of the algorithms as well were daily markets as well. So we, we were just executing at the end of the close of the day. So that's not such a big issue. And um, two of them were intraday. So of course you need to be more careful with that. And of course, then you've got to take into account spreads. Um, so there's some of the uh, issues. Um, I learned, Coding, I learned Python beginning of 2017. Um, and this is how accessible it is. I did it on EDX. This was a three month course. I've done about eight or 10 of these courses now. Um, but this was an MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology course. Um, you have webinars to watch, you have quizzes, you have coursework, you have exams, and that's actually free. You have to pay if you want the uh, certificate. I've done one at the end of last year, three month University of San Diego course on machine learning. Um, and it's become incredibly accessible. Um, it is a big step to do it. It's, it's tough and you need to keep in, it's like speaking a language, I guess. And as I'm getting older, you need to keep in, you need to be trying to be do some coding each day just to keep it going, keep improving. Um, but it's been useful. And for me, I say it's discipline. Um, what I do now is I don't, I've not worked on actually coding up the API link. So we did have that at the fund was all 100% fully automated. Um, the back testing I do for the, the big systematic hedge fund is back testing as I've just described. Trading myself, what I do now is I run algorithms in the morning on 80 different assets, um, currencies, bonds, interest rate futures, indices and ETFs. And then it just highlights what's moved on the daily chart to give me a buy signal and give me a sell signal. And what I can do then is cherry pick certain ones of those. But I only ever buy when I'm getting a buy signal and I only ever sell when I'm getting a sell signal. And the stop losses then I put in manually um, based on technical analysis. So for myself, it's interesting. Sort of I'm so pleased uh, you mentioned the, uh, uh, the MIT. Uh, EDX courses. I mean, I've done a few of those, and there are so many resources out there. Um, that, uh, I mean, and that's, and that's fairly serious training too, but it's free. Um, Absolutely. And those, and actually, those you, that are beginning yeah, this just, journey of training can... need to be aware of the fact that you know you can learn this stuff um, real time. And a great on resource on top of that, if if I can say, is Quantopian. It's a good example. So if you don't have access to, you know, I have Bloomberg here, but it's, it's pretty costly. If you don't have access to the data, you can go on to Quantopian and it's open source, it's Python, um, and you can use their data to do back tests. You can see other people's tests. So you can see someone's coded up on there, the turtle traders, uh, the rules they have. You can copy and paste and use that yourself. And also they have um, monthly competitions as well where they actually, if, you, if your code's good enough, they take it and they use it. So you can learn to code for free, you can get the data for free, and you can end up with a, a fund actually accepting your data, uh, your algorithms, and, and, and using that and paying you again. Yeah, I have so many discussions like this with, with, with Steve about the, the gamification of trading and how, you know, historically, yeah, tr trader in trading room, trader in hedge fund was the trader. Now it's anyone that can grab access to the market and use their their own sort of mindset to to generate alpha and of course people may have evolved into trading from the gaming world and this you know and or the poker world or whatever and so yeah you know, i think you know the, the background market has changed um and so the skill set's changing it's a bit like ender's game you know where you got the, the generals of the future but are the gamers of the current world uh, I'm kind of thinking that the big traders of the future are going to come out of the gaming world. Yeah, an interesting point on that as well is you know, how how funds are using the data. Now we have big data. Um, yeah. One fund I know, they um, I read they ping hotel groups up to a million times a day to get prices for hotel rooms. 
They know the hotel algorithm, so they know in real time what the current and future occupancy rates are of all the major hotels around the world. And also at one of the CMT symposiums four or five years ago, we had a professor came in, or a doctor, I can't remember off the top of my head what he was, but he was background was in biology, and he looked at the mathematical setup of the human DNA, and he created an algorithm off the back of that, and that was making him money, consistently making him money, which is fascinating because it's completely different left field way of trading, as you say, exactly. I, I, as you I just love looking at natural systems for for answers. Um, and, and they're out there. You just need to discover them. But uh, of course, you know, and I noticed that you're using eight and twenty-one and the sort of Fibonacci type series for you know, looking at understanding a market personality. Um, yeah, so there is some natural overlap with with the world of trading and paying attention to that. I think is uh, is very wise, very important. Hearing you say about the gamification. Uh, I recently coached um, I coached a team inside a bank, and uh, the, the, one of the traders had been actually a world champion at one particular game. And he, he was actually, even though he was he was um, he was Scandinavian and he was working in in New York at the time, he'd actually been a little bit of a celebrity, a minor celebrity, in South Korea, where, where this game was huge. So it, it, it's, it's really interesting. You know how how you see that come? I think the game was called, uh, if I can remember rightly, Counter Strike, um, and you know it was huge. And I think for about, I think in the early two thousands, he was, you know, he was one of the world champions of this, earned a lot of money doing that. Um, and he felt that, that that he'd taken that same approach and mentality into how how he was trading FX. Yep, the game I was about changed. to say the fact that he's been a world champion means he's incredibly competitive and he's always trying to work out what the edge was to be successful a quick word from our first sponsor most people enter trading with the fallacy that if you call the market right you will make money in reality it is getting your mindset behaviors processes and attitudes right which matter the alpha mind trader performance program is a powerful coaching program which has been delivered with great success over the past decades to traders and investment professionals around the world. The program is delivered by Alpha R Cubed. You can find out more about this program by going to the Alpha Mind blog page, alphamindblog.blogspot.com, and click in on the link at the top of the screen. Now, back to the podcast. Um, I know the podcast is listened to a lot of retail traders. A lot of people think trading is very easy. You know, 27 years later, I'm still, I'm still learning. Um, and it is incredibly, it, it's incredibly competitive. This, this is what I keep trying to get into new traders. It's a huge skill and you're still learning it. Like you say, three decades later, you know, you, 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 you don't master it so many decades. And, you know, we've had this conversation so many times with people both on this podcast and I've had this with people as well, you know, who, who want to break into trading within six months or a year. Uh, and I say, if you were to take up any sport on day one, you know, you wouldn't be breaking into high levels of that unless you'd played it back to back and been mentored for probably at least five years to get to kind of a semi-decent pro-am level. That's weird doing it every day. And it's the same in trading. You know, I, I say to people, you know, how long did it take you to become profitable? You know, it, they say, four years, five years, seven years. You know, it is somewhere around that, that time. You know, I, I always say to people that when I was a trader, and I know we worked together for a while, but I don't think I became good till about 13 years into my career when something changed very big for me. Um, and then I had a very good, good run after that for many years. But, you know, it, it, it's, I, I, in a way I was, I was blagging it a little bit. I was bluffing a little bit then. Yeah, I had some good runs. I, I Like you, I made a lot of money in 1994. Um, so I did some things right, but I, I had a, a horrible year in 1995 or 90, ni yeah, 1995. So, you know, there's, there's an element of luck in it. I mean, you know, I think it was Adam Nash who said that, 
you know, there's a lot of traders who really they just learn a system rather than trading in their early days. And then when that system stops working or that method stops working, then they don't know how to trade. And every system, every system and method, like you said at the beginning, you have to adapt it or morph it at some point, at some point, because they won't work forever. You always talk about the success rate in this industry, Stephen. What was it? Half, half of a half a percent or something? Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a, there's, there's a lot of data that can be interpreted in different ways. But the, the general rule of thumb is that around somewhere like 15 to 20 percent of traders in any one year make money. But the, the, the most the most widespread look at trading was uh, some some research done by a couple of academics from Berkeley University, Barbara and Odin, um, that they looked at 15 years worth of day trading um, performance from the Taiwanese stock. 360,000 traders. Well, yeah, I was going to say it was close to 400,000. And the actual, you know, what they deemed as, you know, consistently successful traders, guys who they could actually predict would succeed, would make money, and not just money, but would make returns in excess of, you know, all trading costs, you know, could earn a living from it, was less than 1%. And of those, the, 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 the proportion that earned what they called the megabucks was somewhere like a quarter percent or maybe even an eighth to a quarter of a percent. So, so, you know, being successful in one year like I was in 1994, and it sounds like what you were, were as well, is not a successful career in trading. It's being able to do repeatedly every year, which I, I was able to do from about 2001 onwards. Um, it was consistently consistent good performance, you know, in excess of returns, you know, where, you know, someone could bet on you probably making a, pro a profit and, you know, not guaranteed every year, but over a number of years earning a decent return. And that that is what people that is very, very low, you know, incredibly low. But then it's probably not so different to sport or poker as well, where only a very small number can be those consistent winners. Here's a stupid question for both of you from someone that's been more of a broker than a trader, as I've said. But, uh, <laughs> we won't hold example, it against you. <laughs> <laughs> for example, you've had a difficult year's trading and you've guessed lost, right? If I was putting on a trade that was opposite to every one of your trades during that year, would I have made money? It would have been 1995. Do you know what I mean? I mean, so um, if, if I, I would say no. Here's a point. Yeah, here's a point I'm you bring up. Them. Yeah, it's all about the risk management because it's mm. uh, and it's where people, when you have the trade on, and all the the people say it's all about controlling your emotions, but it's really hard to control your emotions because cortisol and dopamine is which you create your you know when you're losing money it's it's cortisol that makes you feel sick and that butterflies in your stomach when you're making money the euphoria the dopamine well the combination of those is the most addictive chemical known to the human brain and if you're if you're making money typically retail traders add to winners too quickly and similarly if they're losing money quite often they hold on to it too long and so the answer would be you wouldn't have the opposite. If I'd lost money, you wouldn't necessarily have made the equivalent amount of money, um, and you probably would have wouldn't have done nearly as well simply because of managing the position. And this gets me back to Twitter. Is all these people on Twitter coming out with their analysis, and they're all saying whether you should buy it or whether you'd sell it? But that's not what trading is about. Trading is about managing the position. And exactly. if I go back to what Steve was saying beforehand. The actual statistics on, and it ties into this, what we're talking about now as well. The follow-up on prof, um, the oh, Professor Odian's um, work from the University of California Berkeley campus. Um, there's some work done from Daily FX did some research, and this was about three years ago. And they're a retail broker, and they looked at the win ratio of the retail traders. And the 43 million trades they identified, they picked 15 currencies, 43 million trades. 
and the win ratio was above 50% for every single currency. So then you'd say, well, if their win ratio, and on average it was uh, 54%. So if they have more winners than losers, why do they lose money? And it's because the average loss far outweighed the average gain. And one other thing on that, the two pieces of research I've seen on the, the win ratio for professional traders. And this was the top 10% the top of traders at one of the most famous hedge funds in the world. And the other one was on 21, again, famous traders who had done the NEOAC psychometric test as well. And both of those, the win ratio came in at 41%. And the, the difference is, of course, professional, the top traders have a lower win ratio because they cut their losses so much quicker. As soon as a trade's in a loss, they'll cut it with no concerns whatsoever. So going back to your question, I would say the answer would be no, because people, when they have the position on, that's when it gets difficult to trade because your emotions completely mm. overcome your logic yeah. and rational thinking. Yeah, they're driving your trade, which is uh, not best, not best. But perhaps, yeah. Steve, it, it, it's a time to ask um, about how, James, you sort of managed yourself through this journey. Can I, can I just jump is in first? Is it the right time, Steve, to have that? It is, it is but I, you know what? Before we do, and this actually could be a good lead into that question, you know, yeah. what you talked about, I'm, I'm presuming the way you talked about it, that you must have read John Coates' book, The Hour Between Dog and Wolf. Um, yes. And if you have, you have, yes. It's a brilliant book, and I, I've, I've got it on my book list, which is on our blog website. Um, it, it's one of the best books I've read about trading, and it talks about the neuroscience of trading, the, these these chemicals and how they control your body. And and the, the the actual phrase, the hour between dog and wolf, I think I think it comes from a, a Native American um, phrase, but it kind of works to that. It refers to that moment of Jekyll and Hyde, which traders go through as they transform when they're under pressure and when they're focused, you know, which which if, you know, we've all experienced whether we're a trader or a broker, you know, whoever is in some high intensity activity, you know, and you talk about, you know, that ability earlier on to learn your biases, right? But actually in the moment, your knowledge of those biases, your conscious knowledge goes out the window, right? So, which is Absolutely, why yeah. so great to have processes and I think in your case you use technical analysis as a tool to keep you disciplined and I, I was the same I used to use technical analysis you know I had to have stops um, that would control me when I was a trader um, so, so I, I, I think it's great you know to give this book a plug because it's such a great book but I think you've spoken about that a little bit and that almost leads us into that that question which Mark asked you you know, how did you manage yourself when you, you know, at times, and how did you fail to manage yourself? Um, oof, how did I fail to manage myself? Actually, I failed to manage myself when, and I was reading about this in the last couple of weeks, I guess, overconfidence and entitlement over gratitude. And, you know, when you're on a winning streak, you know, I had two painful losses. One interestingly was at the start of the financial crisis, receiving Kiwi two year yields up over 8%. And we could see the financial crisis unfolding. And it's a really good example of fundamental analysis, how sometimes it doesn't work or you need something for your timing. But we had this bulletin board where you could type up what you wanted to say, you'd hit go and it would go on every single bulletin board in the investment bank. And it was flashing up, you know, the Treasury desk saying we can't lend money. We've been told from credit we can't lend money to these banks. The mortgage backed security desk saying, you know, the market's frozen. There's no prices. Basically, not so politely saying everyone's screwed. Um, credit default swap desk saying, you know, how bad things are. And we could see it all unfolding. And then the Federal Reserve came out and said, we're ready to cut rates if necessary. Equity markets, which had fallen 8%, suddenly went in the US, went to all-time highs again. And I was receiving the two-year in New Zealand, which hadn't really fallen. 
I was receiving. Right, I was just, just to just to butt in there um, because there'll be a lot of people who aren't used to the language of swaps. So when you're receiving, you're 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 lending or you're selling. You're, you're going short of interest rates. Yeah, interest rates were above eight percent, and I thought they were yeah. going to go lower, and they yeah, did. So they went to two and a half percent, but they yeah. went up first, and I was selling while it was trending higher. And again, that was just you know, overconfidence. And it's funny, you look back, and all I can remember, you know, I had some great trades, I had some great um, P&Ls, but I just remember these two trades. Um, the fundamental view was right, but too big a position too early, and, and it really hurts. And that's when you really learn, is when you lose money. Um, and how I manage myself as well, I guess it's just a competitive instinct. You, the market's always changing, you're always trying to win, and you're always trying to learn, trying to get an advantage. You know, my background, actually, while I was at university, I rode in the Great Britain team. I got three medals at under-23 World Championships, um, national champion three times. And the last 10 years, I've been doing Ironman triathlons, and it's the same sort of competitive spirit. So I have 10 years of a spreadsheet of all the training I've done every single session. But what I've moved to in the last nine months is an app that uploads all my data from Polar and Garmin so it records my heart rate and my power output for every second of, of every minute of training that I do. So I can see my actual fitness and more importantly, my fatigue so that I can manage myself so I'm not overtraining and, and try and you know, improve my performance going forward. And it's just another way of trying to be competitive and you know, I'm in my late forties now, I'm not, I'm not a top athlete by any stretch of imagination, but it's, it's you know, just another example of being competitive. Um, trading, it's, it's not easy, and there's so many different factors, so many different things going on, um, that you've got to, try, yeah, got to try and keep having an edge. And when I get lazy is you know, when I lost money, whether it was overconfidence or entitlement or whatever. Um, and you always get hardest at those times. And that's why it's just a continual, in my view, just a continual learning process. What I'm hearing, that you've got, you've got all the skills here. You've got the technical skills. You've got the fundamental skills. You've, you, you've, you've done behavior, you've read behavioral finance. Um, so you know a lot about it. Um, you, you know about risk money, risk management, money management. Um, so you know, you, you know all the tangible aspects of trading. You know where the pitfalls are. And yet there's this aspect of at the human level, which is the real skill. That's what takes people over the line. You know, if we get to this view that, let's say, only 1% will win, okay? And if we also take a view that that 100%, nearly all of them are very good, are very intelligent, are very capable, are very smart, Let's say they know with the project products, they've all got the same as you. So what is it that gets you over the line into that top one percent? And that's the self-management. That's the having the mindset and the discipline and the patience and the ability to sort of see yourself. So when we talk about alpha mind, what is this whole process? What is this blog? What is this blog we do? What is this podcast? What is this project me and Mark are doing? It is about helping people to develop the mindset for alpha so they can get into that top 1%. You know, it's why we're interviewing now, you know, yourself and people such as you, because you're sharing this brilliant insight and brilliant information. Ultimately, it's about you. It's about having that human edge, which you seem to be working on the whole time, from what I see. One thing I love, I love reading about sports people. I love sport and you know, whether rugby, Formula One, rowing, whatever, and triathlon, and what motivates people. And what's interesting, if you look at tennis, we've had Federer, Djokovic, and Nadal at the top of the game for so long. And yeah. what keeps them coming back year after year when you have all these young guns trying to topple them? The same football, Ronaldo and Messi, how many million or billion people play football on the planet. Yet these two have been at the top of the game for so long. And one pitfall with trading is 
there's a level when you go from gratitude to entitlement. There's a level when suddenly you think, I'm comfortable, I've done it. And it's then, how do you, yeah, actually your mindset changes, but how do you prevent yourself from getting complacent? How do you keep coming back year after year and being disciplined? Because there becomes a point where you think you've done it, you think you've succeeded, and you think you're comfortable, whatever your target was when you started, you've made it. And then all of a sudden, that's a great example of, that's a game changer. If we, if we you look suddenly at, let all your discipline slip. And yeah, if we look at the probably the three most successful, or at least most well-known people, perhaps in the trading investment world, you've got Warren Buffett, Ray Dalio, uh, George Soros. And, and they do, that. they engage in these activities as part of their life. Um, you know, Warren Buffett, has deliberately made a point of living in Omaha, away from all the praise and glory of keeping his life simple. You know, he's made that a deliberate effort, I think, other than, you know, taking business class flights. Um, Ray Dalio has done the same by, uh, well, he talks about it all the time, by engaging in meditation. You know, he, he's almost um, an extreme meditator, you would talk about, you know, and, and creating these principles and making sure he lives by them you know and george soros as well he's got you know his theory of reflexivity you know he's a very mindful person you know whether he engages in that or not you know he listens to his body we know that because there's been stories about from his son how how he listens to the uh what the body is telling him as part of his theory of reflexivity reflexivity um so so there is an extreme kind of an attempt by these guys to constantly ground themselves and, and I know Mark you, you work in this space um, and you did this with yourself as a broker all those years to keep yourself at an optimum level an optimal level you know it's, it's something I had to do really I mean I had final arthritis to cope with I had panic attacks on, on broken desks to cope with I had vicious vicious markets um uh, and a manual process around dealing with clients because you just had 10, 10 speakers and 45 direct lines and, you know, so many trades per second having to manage the uh, trajectory of those trades to market, out of market, to be amended, to be cancelled and whatever, and to maintain some degree of common sense whilst doing everything and not making an error. So, yeah, self-management was absolutely critical and yeah, managing mindset, is definitely part part of edge um you know and i obviously i found my own journey and it's something that obviously we we talk about much with the uh, alpha mind uh, project but um yeah just having the ability to you know reset refresh recalibrate during moments of chaos to gain calmness clarity and control is very much um you know, what i'm about and it's what i sell in terms of my my, my general services. Um, I know the US military do that. They encourage also a, um, a refresh you know, in their time out. Um, and it's also, I think, part of the self-management of knowing when to step away, knowing when to take a break, knowing when to switch off, or knowing that you have to switch off um, to sort of get that cognitive clarity to see what the opportunity is in the market. Um, and James, I guess that also is probably reflected in the way that you've trained for these events. Maybe use your training as that way to get sort of step back slightly to be you know, in another zone uh, as part of your self-management process. Quick word from our other co-sponsor. The Mark Randall Consultancy delivers powerful personal, professional and organisational performance optimization. Mark Randall is regarded as one of the world's leading providers of applied corporate mindfulness. Mark's core service is the HIIT Mind Fitness Program. This is a form of applied military grade mindfulness based on the same programs used by US military special forces to help deliver optimal performance when engaged in operations. You can contact Mark on email, CEO at markrandallconsultancy.com. Now back to the podcast. Absolutely. I used to go running with music blaring, but now I don't. And where I live in the Chilton Hills in England, it's stunning scenery and it's just, you're completely away. You know, a two hour run through the hills and call it mindfulness, whatever. You're just, it's 
complete peace. Exactly. And something really clearly, it's it's fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, one other so. trader, actually, you didn't mention Steve, who I'd like to mention as well, Stanley Druckenmiller, who, if you've seen interviews with him, you couldn't come across a more humble person, and yet his his track record. 30 years he's been trading and he's never had a down quarter. Every quarter for 30 years has been possible. And, you know, he talks about exactly these things. He uses technical analysis of discipline. You know, unfortunately, my track record's not quite as good as his. Um, but again, the personality, it's it, all that we've talked about, you can see embodied in this person. Well, I, I, you know, I talk about an individual I coached many years ago. And I don't think there's a podcast yet where I haven't referred to this guy at some time. Uh, he was a trader at a bank. He's now at a hedge fund. And he was just the most humble person I've ever come across. Now, at the time I was coaching him, you know, this was a large U.S. investment bank. He was working in their Hong Kong office. And you know, his manager said to me, this guy is the most he is the best trader in our company, in our firm worldwide now they had probably I, I don't know at that time you know they were a merger between two large investment banks so they must have had close to 2,000 traders globally and uh, you know I, I expected after that introduction when he walked into the first meeting for a coaching session I expected literally the big swinging dick to walk in you know the sort of a guy who was going to be exuding confidence who was going to be wearing, you know, the, the 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 Hugo Boss suit, the Rolex watches, or the Philip Patek, you know, Philip watches, Philip Patek watches, and you know, the perfect hair. And this guy came in, and he was just so humble; it was incredible. And it also turned out he was a world top 200 poker player, and he had that same air of humility and humbleness in everything he did, and it it kept him grounded. And I think that was, you know, almost. You know, that wasn't the only thing, but, you know, he'd made it part of his way of being. And, and this is what it comes to. It comes to this kind of, you know, I talk about this. It, it, when I say we talk about ourself, it's not the doing of the job. It's the being of the job that I think often makes a great trader. The being of a person, you know, how you are, less so than what you do. And, and you know, if you can develop that side of yourself and put in you know, gifts and tools, because we know the whole time, you know, we have two sides. We have a dog side and a wolf side, a Jekyll and a Hyde, you know, so it's working with yourself the whole time to be able to, you know, you, you know, there's that part of you where you go after you've made a mistake or done something stupid. What was I thinking? You know, and that's when you became someone else when you did that. You know, you went against all your rules you know, all, you know, your entire belief system and philosophy and did something stupid. And, and you know, I put a question out on Twitter this morning um, to the Twitter sphere, which asked the question, you know, what if you could improve one thing about your trading within your control, what would it be? And, and someone replied, you know, more patience to sit on my hands when the market is slow. And, and I remembered that I used to sit there and think, wow, I wish people could tie my hands behind my back on some days. I'd have been a lot more successful if I'd have had that. And you do, you become, you know, like you said at the beginning, with behavioral finance, you can know all your blind spots and biases, but that goes out the window when you're engaged in the heat of trading. That was a brilliant summary you and your flow moment. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've no comment for a while because I was slightly mesmerised by what you said. <laughs> I, I, I stand you into yeah, One thing that is well interesting, one thing that is interesting is the trader at this bank, he was very successful and yet he was willing, he was looking to undergo training, looking to improve. What were they Most of the successful traders I knew at investment banks were, wouldn't have stepped into that room with you because of the arrogance and overconfidence that they already knew it all already. Oh, yeah. When, 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 you know, the, the, I'm a coach now, but, you know, when, when I said that after 13 years, my career went through a major shift, major transformation, that's when at Commerce Bank, I was put into a coaching program that was experimental. And the head of trading who had brought it in approached me because he thought I'd probably be the most amenable person to having it 
in the trading room that I was in that space. And my instant reaction was, you got to be joking. I, I know this. I get this. Why would I do that? You know, why would I need a coach? So my ego came out and got defensive. And, and yet, with you know, I got talked into it. And as I say, it was the best thing that I ever did um, as a trader. It really sort of took me on the right path. This individual, I said to his manager, you know, you know, this bank has offered coaching to a lot of their employees and only a small group actually took it. And one of them was this guy who was the most successful trader there. And I said to him, you know, what is it about this guy? Why is he looking for coaching? What is he after? And he said to me, that's when he said, look, he's our best trader. I don't know why he wants it. He just wants to get better. And if he wants that and it's going to be useful for him, I'm happy to sign that off. In fact, I'm very pleased that he wants to do that. And I wish more people would have taken it up, but they never. And it, it, you know, it, it's one of those great ironies, you know, that, you know, you talked about Djokovic and, and Federer and Nadal earlier on. You know, they don't stop having coaching when they get to the top. They have more of it. <laughs> you know, this is a performance. It's interesting as well, looking at David Brailsford, you know, the head of Team Sky, the cycle team. They went from being just an average cycle team winning no medals at the Olympics to, I think, 2012. They won the most medals by a long way. They won in multiple Tour de France's. And it, it, his thing is about marginal gains and just always yeah. trying to improve small half a percent, one percent gains and put them together. They all add up. Well, you know what? If, if I ran a hedge fund, you know, I would get a coaching, a coach for everyone. OK, whether they like it or not. You know, and most, you know, almost all of them, when I've experienced this, would say no. But I would make coaching a central part of that activity because, you know, if every individual can be half percent or one percent better, you know, that's a huge advantage. And, and there was there was a report out a few years ago by um, it was in 2013, I think, by Citibank, City Prime Finance, uh, conducted um, research into the people practices. So this wasn't even coaching, although coaching and mentoring was part of it. But the people practices of a group of large hedge funds, and they found that the hedge funds that had a dedicated people practice uh, activities and mindset outperformed um, the hedge funds that didn't do it. You know, the top performing ones versus the bottom performing ones. There was a connection between this and it was 200 basis points per year over three years which as you know for a hedge fund is massive you wouldn't get one single trader who could consistently produce 200 basis points on total assets under management you know and, and maybe this is the way it's going to go at some point focusing on performance on human behavior is it's it's an alpha producing activity they are starting to move that to, well, i say starting they for a while now, a lot of major hedge funds have been going that way, haven't they? Of course, Wendy Rhodes from Billions is based on Denise Scholl. And there's another and one more recently, um, Dr. Valiante, I think his name is. Dr. Valiante, okay. And, and, I think it's Valiante. You know, I, I've, I've seen done a couple a little of videos of from him which are very interesting. Okay, I've done a little bit of work in one hedge fund. Um, well, I've done it in a couple of hedge funds actually, but they're, they're sporadic ones and twos usually. Um, I know GLG have started their own internal coaching group, uh, coaching uh, organization, as have NetWest Markets. So that there, there is a slight move in that direction, you know, but it, it is toe in the water at the moment for many of them. And again, the focus is often it, on management as well, rather than um, the key performers. But we, we know also that, you know, uh, Claire, Claire Flynn Levy has started this, um, you know, they're the, the looking at human behavior um, with their with their systems that, you know, it, it, it analyzes people behaviors when they invest uh, Accenture Analytics. And there's some investment firms using that as well and starting to use coaches to help people. You know, they look at the, the behavior. Oh, it's almost a behavioral finance tool to, to then. Try and help I heard Claire speak at the last. Yep, yeah, I heard Claire speak at the last CMT symposium, and it was fascinating. Yes, yeah, it's a great. And also, show. this is where the sports teams are going. You know, they're 
sports has been on this. Yeah. For drivers, for tennis players, for golfers, they've been on this for years as well. Yeah, I know Mark's had a couple of conversations um, with, uh, with with people on this area. And I, you know, there is so much overlap. This is why I keep saying, you know, trading is more of a, a performance activity than it is an academic activity. You know, and, and yet so much emphasis seems to go on, you know, trying to develop the academic side of it. You know what? It's about, you know, if you look at trading, if you look at sports, it's about fluid intelligence, that ability to make decisions on the fly and, and critical moments of complexity um, to, to your best advantage and to be optimal. Um, and that's where the, the overlap is. And I think, uh, in fact, I think the UK is relatively... Um, Relatively slow, if, if you look at sort of particularly what goes on in the U.S., uh, sort of adopting these, uh, th these, I guess, these new ways. Perhaps there have been ways that some of us have been wise to for a while, but they appear to be new ways. Um, I think, and the U.K. is very quickly waking up, perhaps more quickly in sport than, um, than in the world of trading. But I do see it as a trend that where people start to discuss, you know, and understand where others are getting their edge for, from, you know, they'll start to conclude that actually we need to look at the damn site more seriously and invest in these type of programs. Do, do you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm curious because, you know, I think you're absolutely right, Mark. Um, it, it's a shame because we, we've covered an hour now <laughs> of this, and I'd love to carry on with this conversation. Um, and, and maybe we can we can bring that back into another podcast one day. Uh, with you, Jim, because, you know, you are a performer, you're an Ironman, you're an athlete, you're an Olympic rower, or, or I think it was you, you rode for Great Britain. Um, and and th there must be something in that which translates into trading that, that has actually been a huge edge for you. That could, You know, you talk about that competitive spirit. But, you know, what else is it that comes from that world of sport that you feel overlaps into trading? I guess there's a part as well as um, there's, there's overconfidence, which, of course, you don't want. But there's just a confidence in your ability as well, which is important. I've seen people who work in the trading room who just had zero confidence and they wanted to be traders, but they couldn't just couldn't withstand the risk, I guess, or um, the pressure or, or they put themselves under too much pressure. But I think that the, the main thing from sport is. It's, you're looking you're looking for a competitive edge. You're competitive. You're wanting to win, and if you're not winning, then why is someone else winning? Which, and it's, it's constant learning, constant progression. Yeah, it, it's interesting because I, I'm you know you've taken me back talking about this to a time I coached a trader who was also an Olympic rower. Uh, interestingly, he, he'd rowed for us Australia. Well, he, maybe he never quite got the Olympic team, but he was in the the second group and I remember sort of discussing his trading and his competitive edge was taking him that little bit too far every single time you know he wanted that extra couple of points constantly and and then we had a conversation about how he managed that um, in the Olympic team and he he, he reminded you know it, it reminded him of, of when they were training um, their coach, it was for him, it was about not so much about the power coming towards the end of the race, but the coordination, which actually meant the coach would try and dial, dial down their effort towards the end of races. You know, he, he would say, as we're coming to, you know, as you're coming into this final phase, guys, focus on your coordination, because the more effort you put in, the more uncoordinated you're going to become. And actually, he said, when we did that, when we became uncoordinated, that was when they would be taken over in the final part of the race by the team, which may not be stronger, but were more coordinated. So, so he would get them to actually dial down the effort in the final stages of the race. And, and, and I always thought that's a great analogy, really, because... You know, their, their, their competitiveness was, was actually 
getting them and coordinated. Yeah, it's such a tough sport. I mean, it's brutal at the end of the day, but people don't realise how, how important technique is, and it is a skill. But of course, in a six-minute race and the lactic acid's kicking in after, you know, 70 seconds typically, it's just a game of attrition. But what you've, what he hit that, hit that nail on the head then is when your body's falling apart and the lactic acid's screaming at you and your concentration's going, your process is falling apart. And what he's focusing on then is keeping the process. And what happens yes. is we used to have to travel to Europe to, to get competition. And you end up getting to races where you get to the finals and then everyone has the same sort of ability as you. So the, the technique, there's not much difference. So then it's a war of attrition. But of course, as the attrition really kicks in, that's when the technique falls apart and it's, it's keeping the process. Um, you know, I can't think of a, you know, a better similarity to trading when you're when you get becoming overconfident, the, the dopamine's kicking in. You're on a winning you're on a winning run. That's when you're most likely to get blown up, and it's all about sticking to the process. And I wrote an article. And more importantly, it's about having a process in the first place. Yeah, and, and I wrote an article a few months ago, uh, which is on my blog called it, "It's All About the Process," and it you know it, it, it talked about it started with an introduction to. Um, Okay, so it's about the actor Brian Cranston, and it, it, it featured another article I'd read where, you know, he said that early in his career he kept chasing the auditions, and he got he got just get getting small bit parts, and then I think one of his mentors said to him, look, you've got to focus on the process, the acting process. Don't worry about winning parts. Stop focusing on the results. Start focusing on making yourself a better actor. It was all about the process. And once he started focusing on that, then the results started to follow. He started getting bigger and bigger parts. And, and it, this was from his autobiography. So what he was saying was focus on the process, which is why I say to traders in the early years, focus on learning, not earning. Focus on, you know, building up, learning about the processes, uncovering processes that are you know that, that that are congruent to you, that work for you, and and that can help you win, and that ultimately is what you build out of, not chasing results, which is what almost when we went back to this this rowing analogy, a little bit earlier, what this trader was doing was he was he was chasing the results, the numbers, and not focusing on the process. You've summed it yeah, up absolutely. rather I couldn't well. Agree more. <laughs> yeah, couldn't agree more. <laughs> Uh, okay. I haven't got a Isn't process that's it? going to fall apart. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that goes for, and I know we're running over time a little bit here, but that goes for the algo building process as well. Because when yeah. you come back to this very earlier on, and it was something I, I wanted to touch upon, it, it, it's forgotten. You know, that I, I've worked with a lot of people, a lot of quants, and they lose the process on that. You know, it's the building of the algo and the testing of it. Right. You know, we're, we're trading. On a discretionary basis, often it's about the execution. With the algo, it's the construction and the testing and the building, and then the the monitoring. And, and, and that's where it goes wrong, this curve fitting, um, this trying to produce a result, to taking your, you know, taking your eye off what the market does. Like you say, the, these traders weren't familiar with price gaps after data. You know, they weren't familiar with um, with how the market works. So they've created something that against the data looks really good in a, in a, in a sense. What they've done is curve fitted. Uh, and, and I, you know, I've read some data that said something like 60% of, of hedge fund quant systems have been found to suffer from a high degree of curve fitting. I can't remember where I read that, but, you know, it, it's a huge problem. So the, the, the same thing happens when people are building algos. Machine learning, by definition, finds patterns in data, which is you're assuming that the, the, the patterns will be in other data as well. But of course, AI has been shown to be uh, more consistent where you're coding a set of rules and then that's tested on the data rather than the other way around, taking data and trying to find a pattern within it. You know, I, I do feel a little bit because we, we're, we've really, I suppose we've got to wrap this up. Um, maybe we can have another session, perhaps in a couple of months time. And talk about your algo work, because I think a lot of our listeners will be really interested in that. 
and, and, and try and keep it more focused on almost on the human side and the process side of algo building. Yep, absolutely. And what, one final point on the algos is, you know, one, we talked about how the market changes. You know, one risk I see going forward is, and we've started to see it already, we had the flash crash, we had that inverse VIX ETF last year that fell something like 86% in 20 minutes. We had the crash in, um, all of a sudden, the, the biggest move in yen in like 10 years on the 4th of January this year. Um, in Asia time, ironically, while Japan was on holiday. Um, <laughs> And I saw JP Morgan said recently that just 10% of trading is regular stock picking. We have so many algorithms that, and the, the low latency algorithms are typically trend following that we're just getting these exaggerated trends that mean two things. It means, firstly, fundamental analysis becomes harder. I mean, right now, I think yeah, bonds, certainly corporate bonds, are at absurd levels um, when you've got a trillion dollars of negative yielding corporate bonds. Um, we've seen how you know, some of the tech stocks or companies that call themselves tech um, are now suddenly falling very quickly. And potentially when all algorithms are the same way around and they, they, they start to turn, then the markets can get pretty ugly pretty quickly, which is a dynamic we didn't have certainly 10 years ago. Yeah, which goes back to this market's always emerging and evolving and reshaping. Yeah. And any final thoughts, thoughts, Jim, before we kind of wrap up? Um, I think we covered a lot, actually. It's about understanding you know, the processes yourself, um, your biases, um, creating discipline, you know, having a process. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and listen, I'll, I'll hand over to you, Mark, because you've, you've become our regular taker-outer of the, each episode. <laughs> well, listen, it's been a, a fantastic uh, journey in the last hour or so. Um, Understanding how, also with that, how the markets evolved with it. You know, the, the the move from some style of trading to something that's more gaming, that's that's all about process at a personal level and a, and a work level. So, James, we're very grateful for your insights, and I'm sure the audience will absolutely love this podcast. So, many thanks again from Steve and I. Thank you very much. It's been good fun. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for Jim Brody, James Brody, for being our guest on the show today, a huge depth of content there for you, which I hope you really enjoyed and got a lot out of. If you have enjoyed this podcast or the entire series, feel free to rate us. Um, or we would be delighted if you can rate us. Um, a rating on iTunes helps us really move up the iTunes rankings and become um, known to a wider audience. So, so you know, if you do get a chance to do, to do that, please please do so. Please feel free to share um, our podcast with your friends and your colleagues as well, uh, people in your circle who you think would find it useful, and check out some of our previous episodes. It's building up a large compendium of knowledge and insight, which as, as we go, you know, as we talk about, we like to help people to improve their performance and develop optimal performance. Uh, please also check out our social media. We're on LinkedIn, the Alpha Mind group has over 15,000 members. We're on Twitter, our handle at AlphaMind101. We have a blog with lots of interesting articles and and um, and lists as well, pages. So we've got books, pages on books on trader mindset, books on courses on technical analysis, analysis other uh, podcasts that are useful for you to listen to, including the excellent chat with traders uh, who I, I heard last week. I listened to an outstanding interview with Larry Height. Uh, that's, that's well worth listening to if you can. We also have details of our own trader performance coaching program. And, you know, if you want to know about that, go on and look at the page on the Alpha Mind website. And that is, that is really it. That just leaves me to say thank you once again for listening. Have a good week and do join us again for next week's podcast. Thank you very much.